Welcome everybody to this uh, special panel on uh, COVID-19 and uh, the International Communication Association's 20th, uh, 2020 meeting. Um, we've convened a panel, which is a unique panel outside of the program because we live in unique and special times. Uh, and a lot of our members are involved in research, public outreach, uh, and really important questions uh, during this, uh, this pandemic. Um, we live in a time where we as communication scholars are challenged. Um, some of us are working from home, uh, doing online teaching, having care duties, uh, and others are finding themselves trying to maneuver and ask new questions uh, that are relevant and important in this time of the pandemic. I'm delighted that uh, on such a short notice that we've been able to assemble some of the very best things that ICA has to offer in terms of journalism studies, uh, political communication research, health communication, science communication. Uh, and we are going to offer you a panel here with uh, five distinct uh, speakers. We have Julia van Weert, who is Professor of Health Communication at the Amsterdam School of Communication Research, University of Amsterdam. We have Letitia Bodhi, who is Associate Professor at uh, Georgetown University. Uh, we have Rasmus Gleis Nielsen, who is Professor of Political Communication, Oxford University, and the Director of the Reuters Institute. Then we have Hetjin Paik, who is currently working also at the, uh, as a Director of the General uh, uh, Consumer Risk uh, Prevention Bureau of the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety in South Korea and who has an ICA and a communication background. And then we have Dieter Freifele, who is a Taylor Bascom Chair at the University of Wisconsin and Madison. It's really great to have you all on this panel. Um, we'll be doing it as follows. Everybody will have a short introduction where they will be telling about some of the questions that they are engaging in and also why they have started doing things that are slightly out of the ordinary in these recent times. Um, Maybe it would be interesting to start with you, Julia, uh, to tell a little bit about what you've been working on uh, in the recent period um, and how the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic is also shaping your, your current work. Thank you very much, uh, Claes. Thank you also for the invitation to be part of this panel. I would like uh, to shortly describe my two roles that are the most importantly at this moment. First one as uh, Program Group Director of Persuasive Communication and Professor of Health Communication at uh, the University of Amsterdam at ESCO. Probably many of you will uh, know this research school. And secondly, as the member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Corona Behavioral Unit of the National Institute for Public Public Health and the Environment, which is a new role in this Corona crisis. Um, first, as Program Group Director of Persuasive Communication, I'm leading a group of about 50 people. I see it as my main task now to keep overview to make sure that people know from each other where they are working on. And in this regard, our research school, ASCO, also did a very good job, I think, by giving people from the whole department the opportunity to submit a few items for a three-wave panel study on COVID-19. And this study contained uh, many questions from all groups about media use, compliance with um, government um, guidelines, trust in the government, medical industry, support for the uh, measures taken, emotions, and etc. And so this is really great. And in my, particularly in my co persuasive communication group, many people are interested in the impact of factors related to risk perception and media use on compliance to guidelines. Some examples of research where we are interested in, uh, some people investigate the reasons why people adhere to guidelines and why not, uh, why they change their behavior and they compare this for instance, to people's reasons for adapting their behavior uh, when it comes to other uh, behavior, like global issues like climate change and um, so on. There's also people that, li that like to investigate the relationship between media consumption, alcohol use, uh, fear, information processing styles, and, um, and compliance to the guideline, but also to mental well-being specifically in urban settings and among people with different ethnic uh, backgrounds. Uh, there's also, of course, investigation of the effects of specific misbeliefs. I think others will in this panel will talk about this later on. And um, another example is that people are investigated whether self-determination theory uh, guides message uh, framing and how this 
uh, TUE can increase the motivation for people um, to participate in social distancing. My own personal interest is on vulnerable people, especially older adults. How do they understand and comply to the guidelines? What are the eff effects of well-being and loneliness? And also, for instance, what does a uh, tracing and tracking app, how does this influence them? And second, I am a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Corona Behavioral uh, Unit of the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment. And this unit bundles um, expertise readily available for informing and supporting the government. And we have two main aims. The first is to give rapid advice. One example from last weekend, for instance, is uh, what could be the behavioral effects if our government does not advise to wear face masks while other countries around us like Belgium or Germany do. Um, so um, we as advisory get this question and we provide them with an answer very quickly from what we know from our experience, but also from TOE. The second one is that um, they started a very uh, large research uh, with uh, several mains, um, uh, waves, of, uh, sorry. Uh, the first wave was already completed by more than 85,000 people. And the questions, the main questions here um, are, for instance, um, also about compliance, what, so what factors uh, influence compliance, and also uh, what de determinants explain compliance, but also other differences in behavior, well-being and determinants between specific population groups like elderly children, chronic ill people, people in vital professions, and also, of course, just healthy adults. Um, I, th I think what uh, can communication science offer? I'm not sure whether I should talk about that already or maybe later on, Clays. Maybe we take that in a in a later round, then we first do a round now and hear what everybody yeah. is is working on in addressing this, and uh, maybe it's nice then to hear from Leticia what she's working on now. Sure. Um, so I am a political communication scholar by training that has uh, morphed into a more complicated communication scholar over the last few years. Um, part of part of that has been an emphasis on misinformation research. Um, which stemmed from my interest in political communication, um, but has now translated into uh, mostly health uh, uh, communication, health misinformation on social media. And my research agenda for the last five years um, has focused mainly on how we can effectively correct misinformation on social media. Um, so uh, COVID-19 is just the latest example of, it's essentially a case study for, for me and my co-author, uh, Emily Braga at the University of Minnesota. Um, a really interesting and terrible case study uh, about how misinformation um, spreads, what we can do about it, who are effective messengers in this kind of environment. Um, so that is what we've been um, looking at. So far we've done um, a survey uh, looking at kind of perceptions, not only of misinformation on social media, but also perceptions of correction. So how do people feel about other people engaging in these types of behaviors? Do they think that that's normatively good? Are they worried about it? Do they think it causes trolling? Different things like that. Um, we've also, um, we actually right now today are in the field with uh, an experiment that is kind of part of our ongoing research agenda at trying to figure out um, different ways to correct effectively. Um, and then additionally, we teamed up with um, a couple of computer scientists and an epidemiologist um, and have been working on um, a Twitter big data analysis, trying to figure out what conversations look like around COVID-19, particularly with regard to the quality of information that people are sharing. Um, and the kind of early returns from that show that people are sharing um, high quality information. So things like CDC links, WHO links, things like that, um, well-regarded media outlets at a roughly the same uh, rate as they're sharing really poor quality information from URLs that we have validated as being um, purveyors of misinformation. Um, as part of this, uh, we spoke to the WHO a couple weeks ago as, as part of their uh, outreach to academics trying to figure out how to effectively communicate in this environment. Um, and that's uh, kind of sums up what we've been working on right now. 
Thanks so much, Leticia. Maybe we get back to the WHO advice uh, and what you told them a little bit later in the conversation. Uh, but let's um, throw the virtual stick to, to Rasmus to, uh, to tell us what, what he has been working on in relation to COVID-19. Sure. So I suppose one way to describe the sort of overall uh, research uh, got sort of a vision, if you will, of the Wordis Institute for the Study of Journalism is that we ask ourselves the question of what does it mean that there is journalism uh, in the world and particular kinds of journalism? What are the consequences of that, both at the level of individual attitudes and behavior, but also at the level of institutions and how those institutions, whether in politics or technology or in the media, interact with one another uh, in different countries around the world? So the way in which we sort of try to pursue that overarching vision in this particular crisis around coronavirus is to try to understand better using a range of different methods and uh, running our research and empirical research in a range of different countries across the world. Uh, first of all, of course, the role of uh, news media and journalism in shaping public perception of uh, coronavirus uh, and government responses uh, to the crisis and their level of uh, knowledge about the disease. Secondly, to try to understand how this interacts with the role of different digital media platforms, whether it's social media, search engines, video sharing sites, and messaging applications that we all know are in part platforms for misinformation, but are also used uh, as sources of other kinds of information and interaction and indeed comfort by many people. And of course, also collaborate with governments in many parts of the world to offer authoritative uh, information about the disease. Um, then we look specifically at different types of misinformation, uh, working on the basis of uh, uh, data collected by independent fact checkers to try to identify what are the main types and motivations and actors uh, that are spreading misinformation, in particular via social media, but also elsewhere. And across all this work, in line with sort of the general way in which we try to do our work, I suppose we try to be uh, attentive both to um, individual factors that may influence the outcomes here, things like education, for example, or political persuasion or other factors that we have a half century or more of communication research suggesting will impact the influence of uh, exposure to different kinds of information, for example, but also to think about uh, essentially a comparative institutionalist question of how this plays out in different contexts, that we cannot assume that findings from the United States uh, or for that matter from the UK however important in that context are necessarily going to be replicated elsewhere. So we try to do most of this work in a rigorous uh, comparative fashion. Um, I suppose the way I think about what we as a field uh, and more modestly uh, the uh, interdisciplinary team of researchers I have the privilege of working with uh, at the Reuters Institute in Oxford, what we have to offer is really just to sort of rise to the challenge, if you will. Um, the American Center for Disease Control uh, Epidemic Intelligence Service have, I think, rightly said that a pandemic is a communications emergency as much as is, is a medical crisis. And if we accept that description, which I think is a good description, uh, then I think uh, we can also say that, you know, we as communications researchers don't have the insight, let alone the mandate, to tell people, or for that matter, politicians, exactly what they must do. But we can help inform their decision making so they have a better understanding of the likely consequences of different courses of action. People should make the decisions, politicians should make the decisions, but we can offer empirically based and theoretically grounded insight into what the possible consequences of those actions are. And the same way that I think um, the majority of sentient beings on this planet, though clearly this, unfortunately not all of them, um, uh, believe that we shouldn't address the medical crisis without at least in part relying on medical expertise, I would hope that there would also be an appreciation that we should not address the communications emergency without at least in part also relying on communications expertise. For example, from uh, media communication scholars who have domain expertise um, and who work in institutions that protect their autonomy so they are not people who have things to sell the way that consultants might have. And they, unlike say people from neighboring fields, whether economics uh, or law or many other fields for whom I have great respect, have actual domain expertise in communications rather than just sort of reporting things they know about something else to this particular side of the crisis, not because it's the only side of the crisis that matters, but because it's one of the sides of the crisis that matter. And one, I think it's as important that we try to understand on the basis of the best available evidence so that people and politicians can make better and more informed decisions about what they think is the right response to this public health emergency. 
Thanks so much, Rasmus, and we'll undoubtedly get back to that, especially also the question of what does it mean to rise to the challenge in the middle of all of this. Um, uh, let's maybe go to uh, Eugene Peck, who has actually risen to the challenge and has joined a government agency and is in South Korea, a country that has also been uh, a focal point of a lot of attention internationally uh, because of the approach of the South Korean government uh, and public authorities to the, to the pandemic. Yeah. Thanks, Clays, for organizing this session, and I'm very happy to be part of. Um, I, you know, I was teaching and researching in the field of health and miscommunication in the U.S. U.S. Uh, universities, and then back to Korean university, but then decided to um, try this kind of a field uh, last year. So I got this job last year um, um, at this kind of a, a Ministry of uh, Food and Drug Safety in South Korea, which is equivalent to US uh, Food and Drug Administration. So during this COVID-19 outbreak, I, I have been in charge of crisis management and communication. Um, and um, uh, this Ministry of Food and Drug Safety in South Korea actually is responsible for approving and supplying various um, preventive goods of epidemics, such as face masks, um, vaccines and medicines, uh, testing kits uh, and thermometers. Also, it served as part of Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters, where the uh, Prime Minister uh, served as the um, chief. So I have been right there to actually make all the decisions and policies uh, related to COVID-19. So I think I was um, I don't know how to say this, but kind of lucky and very uh, uh, having a wonderful experience to actually uh, applying my theory and research into practice. So let me uh, maybe um, share with you about some of the unique experiences in South Korea first. So South Korea has experienced uh, many ups and downs uh, of, of handling COVID-19, but is now consider considered uh, to handle it quite successfully. Uh, there was a recent analysis of uh, almost 6,000 news reports in 42 countries um, show that uh, several factors and reasons of South Korean successful handling COVID-19 include transparent and open communication and public-private uh, cooperation and collaboration and leadership and civic participation. Um, we also um, evaluated to have no panic no individual stockpiling or hoarding, no containment policy as enforced stay at home. But also another uh, unique experience was we had a general election that had a voting rate of about 66%, which was the highest in 28 years. And we didn't have any new patients uh, since then either. So it was quite unique. And I uh, have to say uh, the government communication efforts were great and it de deserves a little more attention. Um, um, first, the government consistently stick to um, rules of crisis communication, which is be fast, be transparent, and be open. For example, we had a very highly trusted spokesperson, which is the Korea CDC's director. She and the Vice Minister of Health and Welfare did a news briefing every day, twice per day um, since January 20th, uh, and, and still uh, ongoing, um, to inform the number of patients, deaths, causes, and uh, other important uh, policies, new policies in detail. They also took all the uh, questions from the journalists to answer all the uh, answers, and if. Uh, uh, answer all those questions and if they don't they can't uh, uh, at that site they returned and they actually provided in written form and written uh, answers so that was a good part and another thing was that we had a preventive action uh, messages so call to action basically the uh, hand washing face masking uh, and, and social distancing all uh, that kind of a messages everywhere on traditional media social media off-site and basically just everywhere uh, another unique thing was that we also used text messaging on emergency alert system to all koreans with cell phones um, to inform where new patients went uh, and when and with what mode of transportation and whether they were wearing masks at the time. Uh, also, text messaging was used to uh, explain new policies 
and to appreciate and reinforce our, our people's participation. So I think that I've, you know, I've, do, I've been doing uh, health and risk and crisis related communication research, but I think that this was very good chance that I kind of uh, learned that this actually works. For example, in the crisis communication perspective, transparent and open communication can help gain the public trust in government and compliance to government recommendations. So for example, the President Moon Jae-in's approval rating rose about 20% point during COVID-19. In the risk communication perspective, providing enough information through all channels can also help people get proper risk perceptions and make informed decisions about preventive actions against COVID-19. In the journalism perspective, uh, we face more and more fake news and rumors in, in, in various uh, crises. Um, uh, I think that it is journalists' role and responsibility to actually um, guard against those kind of unidentified information. And we've seen that sensational and fact unchecked reporting could hurt news credibility and people's trust in news media. And lastly, there was uh, some public resistance to social distancing or stay at home orders in some other countries and Korean people's voluntary participation in preventing spread of COVID-19 can tell us that proper communication and persuasion emphasizing social norms, self and collective efficacy and subsequent um, reinforcement can be more powerful than regulation. That's it. Thank you so much for the uh, insights and also for uh, taking the time to be on this panel. Uh, I know that your schedule has been incredibly uh, busy over the last week, so we really appreciate that. And I think one of the things that the COVID-19 pandemic has done is uh, to put both sort of science on the spot, and, but also the communication uh, uh, about science on the spot. Uh, and that's why it's so wonderful also to have you, Dietram, here on the panel. Uh, maybe you can speak to some of the work that you've done and also what you're working on specifically right now in relation to COVID-19. Sure, thanks Kleis, and, and thank you for having me. Um, it's, it's great to be on a panel that I, I told Kleis earlier, must be one of the first ICA panels that literally cuts across six different time zones uh, synchronously, so this is exciting. Um, and I, I wanna echo some points that, that different people have made um, already um, uh, and, and, and touch on, on two things that, that are really on my mind right now surrounding COVID. One is I, I co-chair a, a standing committee for the National Academies on Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine um, on, on advancing science communication research and practice. And what that committee was designed to do long before COVID was to start treating communication as a scientific problem. And Russell spoke to this a little bit earlier, um, you know, the, very much like we're hoping to rely on the best available epidemiology or, or, or biology or, or, or other types of research when it comes to developing therapies or vaccines, we should rely on the best available evidence when it comes to communicating, identifying areas of, of concern um, and, and potential interventions. The big paradox, of course, in the larger scientific community that is has always been that a lot of bench scientists in particular have treated communication as something that they can do uh, without necessarily expert input or certainly without without systematic data collections accompanying their, their their work. And so the standing committee has for a while now worked on the idea of how can we how can we provide that evidence but also curate social scientific evidence in a way that makes it um, usable for policymakers, for practitioners in museums and elsewhere, uh, uh, public health officials, and so on and so forth. Um, and one of the things, and I can't remember who brought it up earlier, um, I think Julia, it may have been you, the, uh, the, the idea of underserved populations. I think that's a, a really important um, a focal point for our committee. Why? Because of course in the US, and <laughs> it's kind of depressing uh, falling hygiene because these are, her, her, her examples are all what went right. And I think in the US, a lot of examples um, are what went wrong. Um, and uh, you know, you have, you have much higher mortality rates among African-American Hispanic populations in New York City, but it's not a metro problem. You go to New Mexico, you have 50 plus percent of the cases being Navajo Indians who only make up 10% of the population. So clearly we're having not just um, gaps in terms of who's affected, but, but we also having gigantic gaps in how to reach these people. And I think the communication discipline in particular has done a good job in, in, in some pockets of our discipline of, of figuring out how to reach 
hard to reach or hardly reached populations. But I think, think some other areas of our field, um, and, and I would certainly put the spotlight on, on some of my own work here as well, have not done as good a job. I think that's one. The second area that, that hasn't been brought up yet, so I want to mention it briefly because Kleiss has also um, highlighted the, the idea of, of, of the science behind this. Uh, I think there was a very powerful piece that, uh, um, that Adam Marcus and Ivan Aransky wrote who run a website called Retraction Watch that tracks um, retractions in academic journals, including communication. Uh, so there's a certain uh, human interest element to looking through the retractions over the years. But they wrote a great piece in Wired where they said, Look, we need to realize that most of the science that we're putting out right now on COVID will turn out to be wrong. And that's probably not a bad thing, right? We're, 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 we're rushing stuff for peer review. Some journals take days only to peer review. Um, uh, obviously, there's going to be lots of, uh, of unknowns. There's lots of developing science. Uh, but we do need to realize as, we, as we're trying to communicate what the best available scientific evidence is, um, we may turn out to be wrong, or we may have to acknowledge that, let's say for wearing masks, homemade masks in particular, Guardian just had a great piece a couple of days ago, the science is simply out. We don't know if it really helps or if it doesn't help, and it may do more to make us all feel better than it does to actually prevent a public health crisis. Um, and so the idea of, of, of dealing with a highly dynamic scientific environment where a good chunk of what we're doing turns out to be wrong, I think is a challenge, especially in this compressed time frame that we haven't seen um, to, that degree, to that degree in the past. And I'll just mention one last thing here as a takeaway for all of us since we're in the social sciences. I think some of us, for all of us who are in the field with, you know, and, and we are as well, like everybody else, um, trying to collect data, trying to figure out what the dynamics are, especially around motivations to, to, uh, to maybe believe in, in, in uh, one thing or another. And in the US, we just had a, an interesting uh, piece of data coming out that both Democrats and Republicans don't believe the official death counts. The Democrats think they're underreported. The Republicans think they're overreported, which means they all know what the official death count, death count is. This is not misinformation. They choose not to believe it, which is very similar to what we've seen uh, for, for some other topics. So I think social scientists will be in a similar situation where, where um, our research will, will be looked at very carefully over the next few years, and, 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 and we'll see what, what remains as, as long-term conclusions. and, and, and and what, what uh, turns out to be short-term noise. Thank you so much, Dietram, and thanks to all of you for these uh, super introductions on the various uh, topics that, that you're working on. And maybe that last point is also an interesting one to, uh, to talk a little bit about. Uh, so how do we do this as uh, communication scholars uh, if, on the one hand, uh, we are asked uh, by government agencies, and uh, some of us may even have the feeling that you need to contribute where possible and give the best possible advice, as, uh, as, as Rasmus said, while politicians must be the ones that take the final decisions, so on the one hand, you have that urge and uh, maybe even responsibility to do these things. And on the other hand, you have what Dietrich described as uh, a lot of what we know is flawed because it was not collected during these kind of circumstances in the past. And a lot of what we see that right now will also turn out when we look back uh, as being maybe only, you know, partially uh, correct. Uh, so what is the right way to navigate? And, 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 and you're a special group of people because you're out there right now doing a lot of these things. Uh, but what is your advice? And, and, and reflection on, on sort of striking that balance between uh, contributing while the pandemic is here uh, and at the same time also knowing that you can probably only do the best you can at this point in time. Julia. Sorry, shall I start again? <laughs> yeah, I. I, I completely agree with Dietram that there's lots that we don't know. So it's all about uncertainty, I would say. Um, but at the same time, there are some things that we do know, like in the Netherlands, in the beginning, the communication from the government was mainly guided by vir virologists and not by communication scientists. And this um, made that the communication was pretty unclear for a lot of people. So I do think we know uh, a lot about clear and uh, good communication and that is what we can add. So we gave, for instance, um, in our advisory board, we gave a lot of uh, recommendations also on how the government should communicate. And I 
agree that frequent communication, it was uh, said before, is really important, but al also that it has to be extremely clear. At the same time, of course, there is a lot of uncertainty. So I think it's really, really important also for the government that people should be involved in all the societal and et ethical complexity of the decisions that are being made, and that the government should also be open and honest about uncertainties, and also very transparent where decisions are based on. And um, yeah, so I think that's the only way to solve this problem. Uh, I, because I completely agree, we only have to build on knowledge that we have in other um, health problems. And these are completely different than, than the current ones. Because for instance, in my field, the problems like smoking, drinking, and so on, do, those are health problems if you solve them. You do it for yourself, but uh, I think the big difference with this problem is that all the guidelines, they are not only for yourself, but they are to a large extent for your environment, so for others. And this also makes a, a big difference. Yeah, I can talk a long time about it, but I would also like to give the floor to others. And uh, Rasmus indicated that he wanted to jump in here. Sure, I mean, I think Julia makes a really important point uh, with the example of other forms of advice that come in, which is fundamentally as imperfect as the metaphor of a marketplace of ideas is. I think the fundamental truth remains that there is a demand for uh, ideas and input, and if we don't need it, someone else will. Uh, so in that sense, there is no option of opting out that is without consequences, that has consequences too. And the way I would try to think about the issues that Deep Term is right to raise is essentially say, okay, what are the odds that any particular purveyor of advice are, is wrong? What are the reasons why that purveyor of expertise and advice may be wrong? And what is the uh, uh, likelihood of that purveyor of expertise being willing to acknowledge uncertainty? And if we look at those along those three dimensions, I would say that um, you know, benchmark against um, uh, you know, uh, people who either have no domain expertise or are not scientists, I would say the odds are above average that communication researchers are not going to be wrong about these things compared to the actually existing alternatives. Secondly, I would say if we uh, focus specifically on academic researchers, um, the reasons uh, for them to be wrong will be different from people who have things to sell or interests to defend. And I think uh, while not unconsequential, um, less malign, if you will, in the sense uh, nobody is perfect, but I would suggest the reasons why communication research might be wrong are different from the reasons why other actors might be wrong. And finally, uh, I think scientists, again, while not perfect, are more willing to recognize uncertainty and the limitations of their in own insight than if, shall we say, sort of more um, assertive uh, groups who, who might be selling things or, or maybe in the business of simply having opinions and not considering uh, whether those opinions are in fact based on anything. So in that sense, I think, you know, we are not perfect, um, but I think as a field, I think collectively we are probably better than some of the other sources of input uh, and advice that politicians will turn to if we do not step up. Dietram, you also wanted to turn in and then we yep. go to Leticia. Really quickly, and, and I agree with everything that's been said, just one footnote to that and, and tying back to a, a, a panel, Kleist, that you were part of last year at ICA on replicability and reproducibility based on a report that the National Academies uh, here in the U.S. had put out. Um, and, and one of the themes I think that we had gotten really good at as a field is to rely less on single study media coverage and single study conclusions. And, and we realized that that partly is what contributes to incentive systems that may be you know, people that may lead to people doing less than perfect research. Um, I think there's a real danger right now of us going back to that and not relying on bodies of research. So just expanding on what Rasmus said, part of our expertise and, and, and why we're a better source for information about communication is because we know what the trends are, what the accumulation of evidence suggests is really working or is not working. And, and Hygen's guidelines earlier about good risk communication come out of that accumulation of evidence, be fast, be transparent, and so on and so forth. So I think that's another uh, really plug for our field that I would make. Let's, let's not get pulled back into this idea of, of having one spectacular finding, um, you know, kind of almost like a laser pointer for a cat distract us from, from really where, where our role is in this larger societal debate. 
maybe as I transition that one to Leticia, I can still just plug the ICA uh, 20 conference theme, which is all about open communication scholarship. Uh, and as the conference unfolds, that there will actually be no less than 10 different types of sessions discussing all various kinds of open communication uh, scholarship, and also how we can play a role uh, in having this conversation in a field that is uh, really characterized by having very different epistemologies and very different types of studies and very different ways of approaching topics, uh, but that that conversation and having that is going to be so important. So it's a perfect plug from this panel into the rest of the uh, ICA conference. And with that, I, I throw the virtual microphone to Leticia. Thanks. Yeah, I just want to echo things that have been said already, I think. Um, this is a complicated time and a lot of our research does not clearly one-to-one -one apply to this situation. So I think that we have to be really cautious as a field and as individuals in terms of how we weigh in on things and what we weigh in on, um, because there is a real risk that we can lose a lot of credibility if we go too far outside where our expertise is. And I think that's true both as a field and as individuals. Um, so this is something that I harp on a lot in normal times, but I think this is very much a time that we all need to stay in our lane a little bit. So I, for example, um, there, there are lots of different pieces of COVID-19 that communication scholars have things to say about. I don't know anything about crisis communication. If a reporter comes to me and asks about how people should be communicating about this, I shouldn't answer that reporter, right? Like I should send them to someone that knows what they're talking about more than I do. Um, whereas, you know, if it's something about misinformation, something about correction, that's something that I can talk about um, with some expertise, but with a lot of caveats that we don't know how it applies to this unfolding situation in the way that Dietram was talking about, you know, things are rapidly changing. We don't have settled science on this topic. And that means we don't even entirely know what misinformation is right now, let alone how to fix it. Um, so communicating that uncertainty um, is, I think, really important to making sure that we're not um, creating more um, negative outcomes for us as a field um, than positive. I think that's a uh, very important, uh, yeah, Hoshin, jump in. Yeah, uh, I was gonna just talk about uh, the importance of, of the government uh, communicating effectively uh, with the public during this kind of outbreak. And uh, for example, in Korea's case, the government did a good job this time, but it wasn't like this from the beginning. I mean, from the beginning and actually the last outbreak, which was MERS, Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus in 2015. Back then, actually, it was exactly the opposite of the current um, communication efforts. The communication was just a uh, disaster, a lack of transparency, openness, and uh, being late and everything. So back then, it was uh, a, a very, very uh, disastrous, and uh, government did a lesson in a very, very hard way. They hired many communication experts. Uh, so K, uh, Korean CDC had at least 12 communication majors in their uh, um, um, uh, spokesperson, uh, the, uh, uh, the media room. So uh, I think that communication researchers need to go into field uh, more and then actually to make a, a voice a little louder. Um, I, I realize these days that public health officials and um, government um, uh, uh, officers realize the importance of communication but just don't know how. And the hows and those details need to come from communication researchers and majors and still um, uh, there is a lack um, of communication majors in the public health authorities. So I really wish that uh, communication researchers work more closely with the practitioners and also help public health authorities maybe get a job, maybe temporarily like me, I have a three year term and I will go back to university to do more research. Um, to get a job into uh, in this inside the public health authorities to do actually do more uh, actually um, practical communication that actually comes out of theory. Another thing I want to uh, 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 make a point is that um, I, I think that uh, Rasim was talked about interdisciplinary research, which is very very important, but. Um, 
there needs to be some research between communication um, scholars and uh, practitioners, for example, because I realize these days that I, whenever I do uh, uh, research and actually write a paper, and I always provide some practical implications out of those research, but that practical implications seem never practical enough. So I don't know enough about what is going on inside. So I don't know how to be more practical, more down to earth to actually provide uh, in, uh, implications and practical guidelines. So I think it's, uh, it's going to be very valuable communication researchers ex actually work with other interdisciplinary scholars, but also practitioners as well. Thanks so much for raising uh, these points. I think, first of all, the, the point about the, uh, the experience that South Korea went through the last time and what that actually meant in terms of staffing critical units within the public administration and, and, and bringing in and relying also on communications uh, scholarship in doing that, but then also the reverse side of that coin of how communication scholars and communication scholarship can do more in engaging with these bodies and, 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 and the practical field. Uh, a couple of you mentioned that we are in a good position uh, from what we know to make that contribution. Uh, obviously, this panel uh, is a lousy example of self-selection here because I have you know, uh, only uh, uh, offered a spot on this panel to people who are already taking this to practice. But if we take a step back and we look at sort of where we are in relation to this pandemic, um, I don't want to ask the question if we're doing a good job as a discipline, but I want to ask the question in couch as a question of how can we do this even more going forward? One of the things with this uh, pandemic is that there's uh, there are very few signs that this is going to be a small peak and then it will be over, but this is rather a, a long trajectory and that means that the societal consequences uh, will be some that are at the table for a long time. How can we as a discipline make uh, an even better contribution in that area uh, and maybe also bring in part of the, of, of the discipline uh, that is not yet at the table? Julia, you have the nerve to go first on this very easy question. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, well, uh, thanks a lot. I, I think maybe it's a little bit of a repetition, but I see a lot of um, communication scholars around me that just want to do new empirical research. And I think it's really, really important. It has been said before that we keep track on what is going on and what is, fi what is found in this research and how uh, can we bundle all those results and really bring the fields forward by doing also um, reviews and synthesizing results from different studies and also from different uh, disciplines? And for this, I think it's it's yeah, I just can't I just agree with you, Claes. The open science is so applicable here because. Because I think if we share everything, if we share our questionnaires, we can do, we can use the same measurements. Uh, we can um, do secondary analysis on on databases. So I really think that open science is is has never been more important than in this crisis because this is really necessary to keep speed on it, on the new insights. And um, so I think it's really important to keep each other informed. Also, ICA can maybe play a role in this by making websites with overviews, for instance, per, per division. And um, in my own field, health communication, I do think we have a lot of many good health behavior change model, models, but because this crisis is so different from other health problems, we should, um, this is a unique opportunity to adapt those models and to extend them. And especially the media influence is so important here. It's more important than ever, I think, in health behavior change. So I think here we as communication science scientists can really add something also uh, to the discipline. Mm, yeah. Thanks. These are Apologies. If I, when I raise my hand, I should at least unmute myself before that. Sorry about that. Um, the, uh, I, I, I want to echo a couple things that, that Hyjin said, because I think they're really, really important for our discipline. Um, I think, you know, for a lot of us, as we go up for tenure, we focus on basic social scientific research, and that's good. Um, but I think at some point in our careers, and I think we've done this less so in communication, and there are clearly exceptions, and probably this whole panel is an exception, 
um, but of, of people then shifting their work to do two things. One is to speak to other disciplines, and I think that's a large part, but speak to practitioners and speak to policymakers. Um, and I think that's not a trivial enterprise. That doesn't just happen by accident. It means you publish in different journals or outlets, if even journals. Uh, that means, and this is why I mentioned the Standing Committee on Advancing Science, Communication, Research, and Practice earlier, where this is very new for the National Academies in some fields, that the committee is staffed partly by practitioners who, who take this in the real world into areas of application and fields of practice, and half by, by basic social scientists. Um, and I think as a, as a discipline, we have over the years, we, we've had a bit of an insecurity complex, meaning we really want it to be taken as seriously as sociology and political science and all these things. So we wanted to have our own journals that are just like AJPS and all these things. And, and I think that was a good thing. I think that was important. But at the same time, that also means that some of the messages that, that should be heard outside of our discipline, some of the big contributions to the large sloppy policy questions that don't have good answers, we didn't make. And, and as Rasmus said earlier, if we don't make them, somebody else will make those contributions. And somebody who, has, who doesn't have the same kinds of evidence and the systematic overuses that Julia was talking about and so on and so forth. So I really think we need to get over our own insecurity complex a little bit. And, 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 and that means doing the kinds of work um, uh, that Hygen is doing and, and, and others connecting with, and I, I think, you know, I, I deeply admire somebody who, who takes you know, a, a, a rotator position for three years, um, which I have never done. Um, but I think that's exactly the, 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 the thing that we would like to th see more of. Thanks. Rasmus? I mean, I want to stress, first of all, I think everyone's first responsibility is to the people closest to them. And this is a really difficult situation. And, and I just want to make, be very clear and explicit about that. And everyone understands that. But I think it's worth saying uh, that, that people have caring responsibilities and a duty of self-care that, that I think sort of takes precedence over professional obligations. But when we turn then to the question of professional obligations, I think there's a very fundamental question that each of us in the field have to ask ourselves, which is why are we doing what we are doing? Are we doing it for ourselves and one another? Or are we doing it because we want our collective work to be part of the conversation that a society has about itself and about the big burning issues of our time? And if we answer this question closer to the second option and say we want to be part of this conversation, then there are some things that we are not in control over, which is how we are seen by the outside world, uh, you know, where we stand in the sort of the hierarchy of sciences, uh, and, and also questions sort of how is knowledge institutionalized in different societies in terms of how it's fed into policy processes. The Netherlands and South Korea, in that sense, are very different from the United States uh, or from the UK, let alone from, from, from countries elsewhere. These are things over which we have no control. Um, I normally don't cite the particular fictional version of Aaron Burr, who appears in Hamilton as sort of a, a model of sort of moral integrity, but I will say that the line of, sort of the only thing in life we can control is ourselves, I think has some uh, relevance here. The only thing we can really decide is whether we try to engage. Um, and if we try to engage, I have to say, I think we need to recognize up front it's a competition for scarce attention amongst decision makers in different sectors. And if we want to be part of this, we have to realize it's a competition. Secondly, if we want to be part of that competition, we have to engage, we have to prioritize it. You miss all the shots that you don't take. If you don't carve out time for doing this, you know, then you're not part of it. That's very simple in a way. And the third uh, thing I would say is that I think as, an, as, a, as a field uh, and a difference of a subfield of research, if we value this and, and want to encourage it, we need to recognize and reward it both informally and formally so that the same way that we consider it a meaningful uh, use of a scholar's time, of a brilliant scholar's time, to spend hours and hours and hours reading lots of books so we can give each other's awards, we should also, I think, recognize as valuable if, an, if, an, if a scholar spends hours and hours and hours in really boring, complicated, and difficult conversations with politicians and other authorities about really big, important decisions in our societies that impact the lives of millions of our fellow citizens. And I think this, uh, this answer, Rasmus, is a very strong answer also for asking you all um, about advice, um, because I think on this panel there's a lot of agreement and, and, and you're all here because you have stepped out of that comfort zone and made the decision that you want to apply some of the knowledge and some of the skills that we have from our discipline uh, also to, to very practical and very real questions at a very difficult point in time. 
Um, but we are also in a situation where we are advising a lot of young scholars and maybe even other uh, senior colleagues. Uh, and sort of the flip side of this could also be that there would be an enormous rush where everybody would drop what they're doing right now in order to contribute to this uh, uh, to this debate. Um, and and that's I at least speaking personally is 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 a real challenge too uh, that you want to make that exact encouragement that you've just been pleading for uh, and at the same time you probably also uh, would be careful in uh, sending everybody out and saying okay drop everything that you're working on right now because you also need to uh, to to make a contribution to uh, to this ongoing uh, ongoing crisis so i wonder how you uh, how you deal with that? Julia mentioned in her beginning that she also, you know, is also chairing a big group that also has a lot of young scholars, and many of you are advisors, both of graduate students and, and, and junior colleagues. And uh, so, I'd like the, the panel to speak a little bit about uh, this balance and the advice that we can give, especially uh, some of our junior colleagues in this field. Shall I start again? <laughs> uh, yeah, because for me, it's 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 so logical. The final aim. For, for of our work of course is to make it practical and to to have a contribution to society and to translate what we know from our research in specific um, uh, advices and recommendations but i do realize that um, for our young scholars their cv is their first priority and um, i also see that many of them their main aim is to um, yeah, to do new research and to build a very nice CV, which of course is very important for them too. And how I try to involve them is when I receive um, questions for the rapid advice from the, the, um, uh, from the, the government um, unit where, that I recommend, that I advise, I ask also my, the people in my group to give input and I see that they really really like that and they came up with very good practical recommendations but also theory or evidence-based and that's of course what the government wants to see they want to see some research where it's based on and those people they know that so that's the way that I try to do it to involve them to ask their input and uh, honestly I see their input back in the it is translated in the recommendations to the government and that's really nice to see and they can have a uh, very good input but uh, we have to stimulate that we as seniors have to stimulate it and have to ask for the input i would say who else might want to jump in on this point Tisha? sure um i think i want to echo what rasmus started with his last statement about that we're all doing really hard things right now the world is feels like it's falling apart around us and and it is hard to separate what we can do as individuals from what we can do as a discipline and all the things that we've talked about that the discipline should be doing doesn't mean that you as an individual have to do all of those things it doesn't mean you have to be engaging constantly it doesn't mean you have to be doing you know world changing research in all likelihood none of us are doing world changing research and there's you know some useful perspective in in reminding ourselves of that that we're getting through the day, we're taking care of the people we love, we're taking care of our students, we're doing what we can to keep our universities afloat. Um, there are a lot of big changes that are probably going to happen in the next couple of years in higher education and research and um, just kind of figuring out how we can contribute, when we can contribute, um, I think is an important part of that without putting pressure on ourselves to do everything. Yes, Rasmus? Uh, I mean, I want to just amplify and think Leticia is exactly spot on here. Again, I don't think there's anything that, that takes precedence over, over, over helping sort of our family and, and others who, who, who count on us uh, and the institutions that we're most immediately part of. What I would say, just building on uh, Julia's response to this, is to say one thing I try to stress uh, with colleagues, both uh, sort of publicly in, in our field, but also the people I've worked most closely with at the Wordist Institute is is sort of two things. One is to be sort of purposeful about the choices that we make and how we balance the different things that, that we do. No one can do everything all the time, but everyone can do some things some of the time. And just try to help colleagues think through what are the things that you think are right for you and that, that you think will help you achieve what you want to achieve personally and professionally. Um, and the second thing is then what I try to do is I really try to stress 
that the um, dangerous assertion that there is a zero-sum trade-off between quality research and public engagement, I think is demonstrably wrong. Uh, I think Helga Novotny, the former president of the European Research Council, has been right to argue um, that uh, many of the most impressive forms of science in the 21st century and late 20th century have been uh, premised on being problem-oriented, interdisciplinary, and highly engaged with practice rather than inward-looking uh, and boundary-drawing uh, and focused primarily on self-referential discussions. And also, I would just say from one of the fields that I'm active in myself uh, as a scholar of political communication, I would just point to some of the people I consider role models for me personally and say, you know, whether it's a, a relatively early career researcher like Shannon McGregor uh, or a more mid-career researcher like Talia Stroud or a very senior uh, person in the field like Catherine Hall Jameson, all of them, I think, have modeled scholarship throughout their careers and shown that you can combine high quality scholarship with high quality public engagement and that this is not, there is no, there is a false economy if people suggest that it's one or the other. These can be combined and people are showing that in practice and I admire that. And we should celebrate that, I think. Thanks. Excellent points. Uh, as we come towards the uh, the end of this uh, this this panel, um, I'd also like to echo. I think that we are uh, all of us are also experiencing the the current crisis uh, with both good days and bad days. And it was wonderful to be able to get such a room of people together to talk about what you're working on. And uh, mm -hmm. and I think Leticia is just showing us the example of what uh, what we are all juggling these days. And then how we are mixing life and work uh, uh, all the time. Um, but maybe as a sort of a last round, uh, um, speculate a little bit about what you think will be some of the questions that, that will be central also in your own work going forward. Uh, you spoke in the beginning about some of the things that are driving it right now in terms of new data collections, in terms of trying to apply some of the knowledge that we have from existing studies to the new situation. Um, uh, as said earlier in this panel, this is not li likely to be a short-term thing. Uh, so what will be some of those questions that, uh, that will also be uh, on our agenda for the next say, uh, six to 12 months uh, as we model through in this uh, in this unprecedented times and uh, well maybe we start with you again Julia. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I have some problems with um, music. Okay, uh, yeah I think I, uh, in terms of research, uh, if you speak, uh, if that's the question, that's where the question is about, I already said, I think that for the health communication fields is especially that we can um, add theoretically because it's another uh, type of um, of behavior that we are targeting and especially the maintenance is really really important and I think the media influences cannot be um, underestimated but something that where we didn't talk about until now is the methodological um, knowledge that we can add from communication science I believe that communication science um, have a lot to add in supervised and unsupervised machine learning, for instance, in content analysis. I think this is typically what we as communication science um, can give as an input as compared to other disciplines. So that's our specific expertise, I would say. And an, uh, another um, improvement that we have are making, I, I would say now, is the idea to model the dynamic interactions between variables as a complex system using network analysis. I think also in terms of research, this is something that uh, where we can add a lot also with the knowledge that we will get from this crisis and from the research that we do in this crisis. Thanks, Julia, for making also that excellent, uh, excellent point and bringing in the whole, say, computational part of our discipline and uh, uh, and the, the part of our discipline that is very engaged with uh, with dynamic uh, data analysis and yeah. modeling. Um, uh, yes, thanks, uh, Leticia. Um, I, I think we should all be pursuing the research questions that we were already pursuing, um, just in light of the new world that we're living in. Um, so. I don't, I don't see any particular path that the communication discipline has to take as a whole, um, but I think that, uh, you know, we need to keep pushing forward on those important questions and doing it in a way that has, has specific implications for practitioners. Thanks. Um, Cosmos? I mean, I agree with Leticia. I mean, I think it's about uh, how this crisis creates a chance for us to bring to bear the things that we are good at and that we want to be even better at in the future. And I suppose what uh, what that means for for the team that I work with is that you know I'm uh, 
rounded of Colombia, and, and I have belatedly realized a, a very long tradition of Colombia that, that in some ways goes back to Paul Lassesfeld, and as opposed to sort of the two big things I'm thinking about, and, and, and many members of my team are, are obsessed about right now, is how to think about two different questions. One that Lassesfeld and his colleagues uh, did a lot of work on, and one that Lassesfeld raised but never really did any, uh, any sustained work on. Uh, one is the interplay between uh, different forms of information exposure uh, and use, and then more fundamental social and political factors. Um, and I'm very interested to see how issues, for example, around uh, political polarization and social inequality are going to shape the way in which people understand the disease and react to the disease as this become a more and more explicitly political situation in different countries. So that's one that's obviously very sort of vintage Lars-Fell stuff. And the other one is, is uh, uh, along the lines of uh, sort of Lars-Fell's recognition that the comparative and effects work that he and his colleagues did was primarily short term attitudinal, behavioral, and individual level effects, but that there was a whole area of sort of comparative institutional long-term stuff that they weren't really addressing. And I suppose that's some of the work that we are also trying to begin to do is to try to think about, well, you know, how does this sort of exogenous shock play out in very different institutional contexts across the world where you can't really, I think, reduce this to sort of crude heuristics of culture, but really must understand that there are some institutional variations between how public policymaking functions, how media function, and how the relationship between government and other actors in society function when different societies are responding to a crisis like this. And we, of course, think that amongst other institutions, variations in journalism and news media uh, are going to be an important part of that, and we hope to be able to understand that better. Thanks, Rasmus, also for bringing in the distinct uh, need also for comparative work uh, here, which for an organization as ICA is, of course, always uh, good to have uh, in front of us, but also for the, the changing nature and the changing role that institutions, both in the public health field and in the media field, but also the institutions of universities that, we will, uh, that we're working on will, will also be challenged as, as we uh, go through the next, uh, next period. Um, let me uh, go to you, uh, Hu Jin. Yeah, um, uh, actually, uh, other people also talked about some of this risk perception uh, uh, related uh, research, which is very important. Uh, one research question I really want to, I really think needs to be quickly tackled is related to fake news, because I realize fake news is very becoming a more and more serious, particularly in this time of a national and, you know, global uh, outbreak. And uh, I think so relate to this fake news, how can we deal with this fake news and uh, rumors? And particularly, what are the ways that journalists can be more responsible for fact-based you know, uh, news and guard against this uh, fact, uh, fake news? And also the individual side, how can we improve individuals' media literacy with, uh, to discern fact versus uh, fake news? So that can be one uh, interesting research question to pursue. Another thing is probably less attention has been paid to, um, which is more um, multi-level perspective to understanding how uh, communication works at different levels, like organization level and policy level, and also uh, a more group level. So how are, what, what kind of a, a roles the communication play in this decision-making processes across institution or within organization, within, uh, uh, within these public health authorities and so on? Yeah, thanks for bringing this in, which I think is also a plea for uh, uh, in expanding our uh, perspective across a lot of the divisions and interest groups that we have wonderfully within the ICA, but, but also the need of, of looking across them and having a more holistic approach to this, as well as working with other uh, disciplines. Thanks. Uh, Dietram, you get to have the last sort of uh, missionary remark for the next six to 12 months. It's definitely not going to be visionary, but I, I, I want to be a little bit contrarian um, on the on the misinformation front um, because I, I think there's lots of really important work, much of it done by people on on this panel and elsewhere. Um, but I think there's a real temptation right now for our field to to jump on a bandwagon that's very powerful in different areas of science, uh, and that is that misinformation is our core problem. That this is what what really COVID nineteen has brought out and. And we need to speak out and we need to fix this. We've called this for a long time in the science communication field, the deficit model, the assumption that simply you know, correcting information and getting people the right information will make them uh, make better choices. And, and we know that that's not true. We know that people don't not socially distance because they don't know any better. It's not that they don't smoke cigarettes because they don't know any better. They do know better. And that we still all engage in behaviors all the time that are not uh, in line with the best available evidence that we know. 
to be the best available evidence. So I think we really need to answer the big question surrounding that. Is misinformation a bigger problem for COVID-19 than it was before? Is it directly related to the behavioral outcomes that we care about and to the large policy questions that surround COVID-19? And that's the first step of evidence that, or, or the basis of evidence that we need to provide before we start talking about interventions. Uh, because otherwise I think we're really, it, it, and there is this temptation and I fully get it to, to follow the money and a lot of philanthropic money is going in that direction. Um, but this is also where part of the intellectual leadership of our, of our field comes from. And I'll, I'll, I'll add one minor footnote to, to what Rasmus said earlier. I, th I do think we have a role in changing the larger infrastructures of funding and other things um, and, 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 and speaking to what those structures need to look like in order to challenge the big sloppy questions of our time. Are we going to solve COVID-19? No. Climate change? No. World hunger? No. Are we in a position to make valuable contributions to making a world a slightly better place on all of these things? Absolutely. And I think that's where our role should be. And, and I think the, the, uh, the, the uh, providing not just a research base, but also the, uh, the, the intellectual leadership and policy leadership is going to be really important for our field and for ICA. I find that to be quite a appropriate uh, sort of remark to close the panel. I want to thank every one of you for taking time in these uh, unique times for being on this panel. We made it impromptu, but I believe that it was super valuable to show some of the scholarship that is ongoing in our community, but also to speak a little bit to what the role is of communication uh, scholarship uh, and the kind of questions that we are seeking to answer and whether or not we are revisiting some older questions in the light of a unique situation or whether there are also really new questions entering, entering the state. So a big thanks uh, on behalf of ICA to all of you. With that, I'll stop the recording part, but please stay on for a few more minutes.